Well, hello and welcome to our service of worship for this sixth Sunday of the Easter season. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. In the morning, God hears our voices as we lift our songs of praise. In the morning, we hear that still, small voice of God speaking to each one of us, individually and yet corporately and collectively. In the morning, we look for God alive and at work in our midst, in our communities, and in our very lives. In the morning, we find God welcoming us to a new day. And in the morning, we come to worship God. Let us worship God this morning by beginning with our two songs, There is a Redeemer and Jesus Stand Among Us.
Let us pray. Gracious God, you knew us and you chose us before you even formed us in the womb. Fill us with faith that speaks your word. Fill us with hope that does not disappoint and love that bears all things for your sake. Until that day when we shall know you fully, even as we ourselves are known fully by you. Loving God, you have done great things. Who is like you? You alone are our rock and our refuge. You alone are our strong fortress and our help in times of trouble. You alone are our hope, and in you alone we place our trust. We thank you and we praise you for your constant presence in our life. Merciful God, your love never ends. We confess to you that we do not always share your love as we should. Where you have called us to live as one, we often live as divided members. Where you have called us to give our spirit-given gifts, we often ignore that call. Where you have called us to forgive, we have forgotten that we ourselves have been forgiven. O Lord, we seek your mercy today, yet we ourselves look for payback when we are wronged. We think it only fair in what is right when we retaliate and use harsh words and withdraw from relationships. The forgiveness you offer on our account is larger than we can comprehend or imagine, and yet still we withhold forgiveness and carry grudges over petty things. We are eager to do your judging, and even worse, we conspire our inner thoughts to secure your forgiveness for us while avoiding others. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. Save us, Lord, and in your mercy, forgive each of us and help us to change. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his people. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Amen. And now let us sing together, Jesus Loves Me. Now we come 
to the time in our service where we look at our mystery bag. And Heather, uh, we have a mystery bag today. This, this is from uh, Bonnie Smith. This mystery bag today is brought to you. So I feel like the Sesame Street, this is brought to you by the letter N and the number nine. No, this is brought to you by Bonnie Smith today. So thank you, Bonnie, for your contribution to whatever is in here. And now we're about to find out. We have, it looks like bird seed. We have a bird, which would make sense. We have We have a book, Birds of Ontario, and open here for a clue. Well, we'll look at the clue then. The clue is opened to the Chipping Sparrow. It says a Chipping Sparrow and Dark Eyed do not share the same tailor, but they must have attended the same voice lessons because their songs are very similar. And I'm not going to read through all of that, but I think what Bonnie wanted to, uh, maybe she didn't, maybe I'm wrong, Bonnie, you can correct me, but the way I would go with it is when I first see the bird seed, the bird and the many birds of Ontario, is the immediate passage that comes to mind in the Bible is when Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew that look at the birds of the air, that they don't store, they don't sow or reap or store anything in barns, and yet the Lord looks after them. So how much more will the Lord look after us? So that's a comforting passage that tells us that even as God cares for all of creation, including the birds of the air, he cares for us as well. Now, I know my mom loves to feed birds. She has about six bird feeders in her backyard and multiple kinds of birds that come, doves and finches and cardinals and blue jays and robins and you name it, they all come and she just loves to watch them and she feeds them faithfully every day. I know when Faith goes for a walk, our granddaughter Faith, she just loves to point out the birds and chase the birds. And so when we look at the birds, we're reminded that God cares for even the birds of the air. So how much more does he care for us? And it's just a comforting passage to let us know that we are indeed in the care and the hands of God the Father, that just as the birds and all of creation are. So I don't know if that's where you're going with that, Bonnie. I hope I was close to uh, what you were thinking, and maybe you can tell me this week. Uh, we thank you once again for the mystery bag. And again, if you want to uh, give Heather an idea or you have something that you want to put in the bag, just give Heather a call or a messenger on email or Facebook and she'd be happy to put it in there for you. So thank you so much for that, Bonnie. And I'll just give these things back to Heather. Thank you, Heather. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we come to your word and your message for us this morning, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, that all we do here be for your glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one scripture lesson this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 7 to 20. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which a Passover lamb had been sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a sign of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for all of you. This is the gospel of Christ and the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to that passage, it reminds us that uh, just in a few moments, we're going to be celebrating communion together, uh, yet apart. 
Uh, and so I remind you, if you haven't done it already, to find some bread and some juice in a cup and have that ready for when we get to that point of the service. But when we look at this, this passage where Jesus is talking about the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it reminds us that there are symbols in our life of things that bring back memories for us. Sometimes we have symbols that bring back good memories, and sometimes there are symbols that bring back not so good memories and some difficult ones for sure. For example, I have a wedding ring on my finger. That is a symbol of the day almost 26 years ago when Heather and I were married. And I remember that day, it was sunny uh, and it was warm and I remember the ceremony and I remember the music. Uh, and I remember also that I had one job on that day and it was to book the hotel for that night, which I neglected to do. So, Needless to say, we left the church oh, around 8.30 in the evening. We headed, we were heading for Algonquin Park. We made it just north of Aurelia to a little burb that you would miss if you blinked your eye. And there was a motel there. And we pulled into there and we walked into the room that had turquoise walls and orange carpet. And it smelled like curry for some reason. And there was trucks coming in all night with the lights coming in the window. And the next night, we uh, made it to Bracebridge and we stayed at the River Inn, right on the river, and it was a little bit better than the night before. And then we made it to Algonquin Park, finally, to where our destination was, to Bear Trail Inn, and it was a beautiful cabin on the lake with a hot tub and, and, and beautiful scenery all around it and a fireplace. And I told Heather that I kind of did that on purpose. She doesn't believe me because I wanted to show her that every day with me would get better and better and better. And I can hear her rolling her eyes behind me. Uh, Dave's not in his head, so I think I'm, she probably is rolling her eyes behind me. But we have symbols that remind us of, and they bring back memories and, and of good things. But again, sometimes there's difficult memories. Heather and I also in our home have a small ceramic cross which uh, signifies the time that we lost a baby at the three month uh, period. And uh, that is a memory that is not so happy for us. And so there are many different symbols in our lives, photos or whatever it might be that bring back memories. And when it comes to the Last Supper, Jesus is having a meal with his disciples and he wants them to remember this time because it's the last time they'll be together. Jesus knows that his end has come, that his time has come. Even the disciples know it, because the Jews were out to get him. The Romans were out to get him. And for some unknown reason, one of his own disciples was out to get him. And yet Jesus wanted them to know that in this time, in this place, in that room, that upper room where they shared this meal together, that this would be different. And he wanted them this time, as it tells us in the Gospel of Luke, to do it, the Passover meal, to do that meal in remembrance of him. But what exactly are we doing when we celebrate communion? We celebrate communion six times a year here at Wasaga Beach Community Presbyterian Church and other churches do it more, some do it less. But what is it we're actually doing when we come together to celebrate communion? Communion literally means sharing. The word communion comes from the Greek word for sharing, for participating together in something. The root words in communicate or in common or community all connote this idea of coming together as one body, yet many individuals. And I think that's no more true than even today, as all of you are in various different places uh, worshiping with us this morning, just as we are here, yet we are one body with many parts, united in Christ. One bread and one body is what Scripture tells us, that we are to believe, that, and that not only to believe, but that we, be, we are to be one bread and one body. And yet an argument over whether we should use unleavened bread or not unleavened bread is still going on today. One body, one bread. And yet my Protestant friend who wants to go with his Catholic mother to communion at the Catholic Church can't join in communion with her one bread in one body, yet the Protestant Church still argues over whether the blood and the body of Jesus are actually the bread and the wine, they become that, or is it just a symbol of that? One bread and one body, and yet we are divided in so many ways. One bread and one body, what does that mean? 
this has been called communion, it's been called Eucharist. Paul calls each member of his Christian community at that time in Corinth to examine themselves before they partake of this meal together, whether you call it the Eucharist or communion or the, or the memorial supper or whatever it might be, so that when they come together, they are taking it as one body, surrounded by God's love and the body of Christ, which is the reason that we partake of this meal together. What remains absolutely central to this ritual, however, is the concept of community. The idea that distinctions and barriers fall away in the midst of celebrating the Lord's Supper together as a body of Christ in this place and wherever you find yourselves this morning. The language from the Gospel of John does sound familiar. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 on the hillside, and there likely would have been about 15 to 20,000 there, before he distributed the food, the bread and the fish, to all of those people that were hungry, he said he broke the bread after giving thanks, and he gave it to all of those people. He fed all those hungry people, but he only did that after giving thanks and breaking the bread. That was a foreshadowing of this communion, of this Lord's Supper, of this Passover meal that Jesus was having with his disciples, which we will celebrate in a few moments. Communion is, just, is not just a matter of community together, but is also a matter of outpouring of God's love. That when we have been fed in this meal, we are to go out and show that love to the world and to our neighbors and to our community. He gathered people to break bread together. He said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. Just as you did this for the least of these, my brothers and my sisters, you did this for me. Jesus is talking about physically caring, showing hospitality to people in need. We are fed here by Christ so that we can feed others spiritually. I remember a time when Heather and I were in Bible college uh, in T at Tyndale. Back then it was uh, Ontario Bible College. We, we went out one morning with bagged breakfasts for people and people who were sleeping on the street or in doorstops or steps, um, we would give them food and we would feed them. I remember coming upon one band shell where there was about 15 to 20 people sleeping there in sleeping bags, eight of them were children, and we fed them. And not only did we feed them physically, but we talked with them and we prayed with them. And once we fed them physically, we were all fed, fed spiritually. And that's what communion is all about. That's what being the body of Christ is all about. Max Lucado tells a story about the baker and the beggar. He said a, be a beggar came to the bakery one day and asked the baker, could you please give me some bread? And the baker confidently responded, well, how wise you are for it is bread you need. And I have all the bread you need. I know everything there is to know about bread. And he started to read to the beggar from his cookbook of life. And he told him about barley and wheat and flour and the process of making bread. And he used impressive words. And the beggar simply said, I just want some bread. He says, well, how wise you are for it is bread I have. I have the true bread. Let me show you the inspiration room. And they went into the bread bakery inspiration room with stained glass windows and a lectern at the front. And he said, every Sunday, people come here to the bakery, to this room, to hear me read from the cookbook of life and to talk about bread. Would you like to hear me talk about bread now? The beggar said, no, I just want some bread. And finally, he took him out to the street he said, look up and down this street. There are many bakeries, but none of them serve the true bread like I do. Some of them put too much flour in it. Some ovens are three degrees too hot, but my bread is perfect. And at that, the beggar started to walk away. And the baker said, what are you doing? Where are you going? And the beggar turned and he said, I'm just not hungry anymore. And the baker went back into the bakery and to his office. And he said, I guess people just aren't hungry for the true bread anymore. And that story highlights the fact that sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves and the churches and what we're doing that we forget that people are hungry, that people are hurting, that people are broken, that they just want bread. And we can feed them physically so that we might be able to tell them about this bread of life, this bread of life, Jesus Christ, who, who offers us grace. 
He, he invites us to come to the table, which we'll come to in just a few minutes. And anyone is invited there because of what Christ has done for us, not because of anything we have done. And it's personal. Jesus said, I do this for you, wherever you are, wherever you are worshiping with us this morning. Jesus died for you. And we come to this table because we have been all invited. Remember who Jesus had dinner with the most, prostitutes and sinners and outcasts and tax collectors. And Jesus fed them and he dined with them and he fellowshiped with them. And they received much more than that. They received much more than physical nourishment. They received grace and a sense of belonging and a sense of home and a sense that they matter. And when we come to this table, that's exactly what this is all about. Jesus invites us into all of that. The writer Ron Hansen said in his book, A Stay Against Confusion, that when he had his first communion experience, he thought that when he took the bread and the juice, he would somehow become a super spiritual person, a super Christian. He'd be able to memorize scripture and walk on water, and he didn't know what would happen, but he thought something great would happen. And he said, when I took the bread and I took the juice, I was still me, and yet I was different. He experienced grace in that moment and forgiveness, and that's what we're offered. Tony Campolo tells a story of when he was a child and had his first communion. And then after the minister had said the words from Paul's letter that only those who are worthy can come to the table, this young woman in front of him started to weep and sob and shake because she knew, or at least she thought, she was unworthy. She, she wasn't worthy enough to come to that table. And so she wouldn't take the bread. And so Tony said his Sicilian father leaned over to her in broken English and said, take it, girl. This is for you. Take it. And she took the bread and she took the juice. And it was like a burden had been lifted from her, she said. Like all of the burdens that she'd been carrying with her, suddenly she wasn't carrying anymore. And it changed her life. And that's what communion is to be about. You know, sometimes we come to communion just as a sense of routine or sense of duty. We come to it in a sleepy way. I remember I was serving communion to a gentleman in a nursing home uh, a year or so ago. And in the middle of the communion, before I even got to serving him the bread and the wine, he fell asleep. So I, maybe I was that boring. I don't know. But he fell asleep. And so I just touched the bread to his lips and touched the cup to his lips and I had a prayer. But I think sometimes that's the way we come to communion. And we're supposed to come with open hearts and open minds and, and hearts full of grace and humility and, and ready to receive what Christ is offering us in this amazing thing that he has done for us. Because communion is for the hurting, it is for the broken, it is for all of us. At that supper, Jesus is not served, but Jesus is the host when we come to the table. He is the one that is offering us his body. He is the one that is offering us his blood. He is the one that is offering us his grace, his forgiveness, and his love. It's not about knowing about Jesus. When we celebrate communion together, it's about knowing Jesus. There's a story about a church that was having people do readings and recite poems and scripture readings and all that sort of stuff. And one of the members of the congregation was a professional actor. So he got up and he recited Psalm 23. And it was eloquent, eloquent and beautiful and perfect in his dynamics and his pitch and all it was just perfect. And people applauded. And there's a young woman, she didn't know what she was going to do. She, did, oh, she knew Psalm 23. She didn't want to follow that. But she got up and she started to recite Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And she started to cry and she started to weep, but she got through the entire psalm weeping because she was speaking and reciting the psalm, not from her head, but from her heart. Not from a book, but from experience, from her life experience, what she had lived, her experiences of God, who offers her grace and forgiveness. And the actor watched that. And he went up on stage. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I know the psalm. This woman knows the shepherd. That is the difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. So now as we, as we take this communion together, I invite you to have your bread and your cup ready to join us.
to participate, to prepare yourselves. I pray that you will be changed, that you will be blessed, that you will receive grace and forgiveness, whatever it is you're looking for, that you would come to this time with open hearts and open minds and open lives and open ears and open hands, ready to receive whatever it is that God might have for you today. Amen. Now let us sing together. Let us tongues and talents employ. come to this table this morning, we are reminded that this is not our table. It's not the church's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. But this is the Lord's table. And we come to this table this morning not because we must, but because we may. The, the Lord himself invites us here. All are welcome here at this table. This table of new expectations, new beginnings, where Christ meets us here, wherever we find ourselves today. And he offers us grace, love, and forgiveness. And the Bible tells us that they will come from the north and the south and from the east and the west, all to sit here at the table in the kingdom of God. I pray that this will be a time of blessing for you as you celebrate communion with us in this time. Come to the table. Let us pray. Loving God, in your wisdom, you made all things and you sustained them by your ever-loving power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time and of your great love for the world, you sent your one and only Son to be one of us, to redeem us, to heal our brokenness. Jesus healed the sick and he fed the hungry. He opened blind eyes and broke bread with outcasts and sinners. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Raised from the grave, he won for us victory over death. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you and will come again and make all things new. You do not give up on the broken and the lost. You do not give up on the fractured or the shattered or the wanderers. You do not give up on the fearful or the hateful or even the impossible. You do not give up when there is no heartbeat left or no heart at all. You do not give up and you do not leave us alone. For this we are truly grateful. Meet us here today at this table in the midst of our mess and make us new again. 
Gather us now at your table, O oh God, that we might be sustained in our journey of faith, that we might be the salt and light that you call us to be, that we might receive the very bread of life itself. May these gifts of the earth for us be the gift of goodness made presence and made known in you, and grant that we who eat this feast may be filled with your life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus had supper with the disciples, the night before he was crucified, Jesus took the bread at that meal, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat this bread, and as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. And at that same meal after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is a sign of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. Each time you drink of this cup, and as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. And these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Now I invite you at home to take the bread that you have near you and take it in your hand, because this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And I invite you to take the cup this is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Generous and life-giving God is here at this table that we have met the very bread of life, that we have been fed by your love, nourished by your grace as you have poured out your spirit upon this bread and this cup fill us with the spirit of jesus so we may go from here to be your people feed us with the bread of heaven so we can fill the hunger of this world touch our lips with salvation's cup so we can proclaim the good news of this day to everyone we meet christ you have nourished us in this meal you have fed our bodies and our very souls. We have heard your love send us out to speak it. We have seen your love send us out to show it. We have been fed by your love send us out to share it. And let all things be done for your glory. Through Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, now and forevermore, may this be our prayer as we have taken and eaten this bread which is broken for us, as we have tasted this cup, which is poured out for all people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I invite you to sing with us. Sing them over again to me.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace now and forevermore. May each of you go now in peace. Amen. Once again, we thank you for joining us for this time of worship this morning. We thank you for joining us for communion. And until next week, may each of you stay well, stay safe, and stay connected. Blessings to you all. Thank you.